According to new reporting from investigative journalist Lee Fong, activists from the National Diversity Coalition assisted First Republic Bank, a commercial banking company that went defunct yesterday, in pushing for weaker regulations. The coalition reportedly attempted to frame bank deregulation as a boost for minority groups. Joining us now to discuss is invas investigative independent journalist Lee Fong. Lee, welcome. Uh, tell us uh, more about this story. Well, uh, following the 2008 financial crisis, legislators passed big financial reform laws. Um, one of those, uh, the main pillars of that law uh, was this systemic uh, risk uh, assessment, the systemic, uh, uh, systemically important financial institutions that big banks that could cause, um, a, that if they collapse, could cause uh, a disruption in the banking sector and the broader economy they should be under increased supervision and oversight. Um, you know, their loan portfolio should be supervised. Um, their, their major decisions um, should be kind of passed through regulators. Uh, these were very special rules, but they set a $50 billion threshold uh, initially. So mid-sized banks, banks like First Republic, uh, banks like Silicon Valley Bank, uh, lobbied for many years to, to gain an exemption uh, to those rules, and they ultimately were successful in 2018. They, they, they changed the threshold. They convinced policymakers to, to change those rules. So these rules never uh, applied to these banks that are now failing. Um, that's a big part of the discussion right now about these, these bank failures. Should, have they, should they have been under more supervision? And so I, I took a look back at um, some of the lobbying tactics that these banks engaged in. And you know, one slice of this is that uh, when First Republic was going to uh, regulators to the Federal Reserve, to the FDIC, and saying, you know, we don't want these um, regulations to apply to us as a mid-sized bank. Um, they were working with the National Diversity Coalition, the National Asian American Coalition. These are these diversity groups, and they were going on on the First Republic's behalf to to policymakers and saying, uh, don't apply these rules to First Republic. You know, if, if they have to um, comply with these burdensome regulations. They won't have enough money to, to invest into minority communities to give to uh, philanthropic groups uh, like ourselves. So, Lee, do you believe that only these activists with the Diversity Coalition were the folks advocating for this kind of deregulation? Because I've heard, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and many other mid-sized banks were lobbying for quite some time, members of Congress, to increase the threshold from $50 billion to $250 billion for stress testing. So is it your belief that this solely came from the influence of diversity activists? Oh, oh heavens no. But, <laughs> you know, this is, you know, one kind of tactic, one of the many um, strategies used by the banking lobby. You know, the banking lobby has a very powerful trade group, the American Bankers Association, that kind of acted like a super PAC that ran ads that thanked many of the Democrats and Republicans that changed this threshold that, you know, created basically an exemption for banks like uh, First Republic Bank. Um, they hired dozens of lobbyists, you know, former congressional aides to, you know, senior lawmakers of both parties. Um, you know, my report highlights uh, one of those additional strategies that, you know, um, any successful lobbying campaigns has to take into account the kind of politics and culture of the target audience. And a lot of these banking regulators um, lean a little bit to the left. You know, they, they happen to be Democrats, maybe culturally liberal. And if you want to influence um, that kind of set of uh, policymakers, um, it, it's very useful to use these types of arguments that, you know, you, you use diversity organizations. Um, you use kind of these uh, groups that, that call for multiculturalism, you know, Asian American coalition is, is, is very much branded as a social justice organization. Um, so they, 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 they probably had more cachet for these policymakers when they made these types of messages. It's, it's kind of a, a standard lobbying playbook. You know, we see uh, similar campaigns by um, tech companies from big oil, from big coal, you know, pharmaceutical companies famously use these tactics, you know paying off uh, third party groups that have credibility with the target audience with certain policymakers to make their case on their behalf. So, you know, the National Diversity Coalition, um, they were engaging in this kind of tried and true tactics, you know, going to these bank regulators, making a, a pitch that these banking regulation exemptions would help underserved minority communities. Um, and ultimately, you know, that, that's that's what happened. That's what policymakers um, decided in Congress. 
Do you think these groups, I mean, I guess they would have to be, are these, the activists, diversity activists aware to the extent to which they're, I guess, is they're not being taken advantage of. They're, they're willful participants. They're receiving, you know, lobby, or they're receiving contracts, I guess, to lobby on behalf of these organizations. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't trickle down to your, you know, your person out on the streets with like, a, we need more diversity sign. If, if there are any, if there are any of those up to that these days. No, but, sure. uh, and this, this is a really important distinction. You know, there are a lot of people who genuinely uh, support the kind of rhetoric um, that's outlined in these letters that I, I posted, um, you know, that, that support um, diversity, sure. But there's another set that, I'm, that I, I think deserves a lot more scrutiny. There are political operatives that receive big dollars from corporations, um, in this case, First Republic, but again, many others, that make very cynical arguments, that use the language of social justice, use the kind of symbols and, and rhetoric of, uh, of diversity to press for um, basically corporate lobbying campaigns, for corporate deregulation. You know, the same organization that I highlighted in this piece about First Republic, um, you know, they've taken money from PG&E, you know, they wrote letters on and, and filed uh, briefs on, on behalf of Uber when Uber was kind of lobbying against stronger worker protections for drivers. Um, the list goes on. You know, th 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 there's a, a, a kind of a set of lobbyists and political operatives around the country in D.C. and Sacramento and other places where this is their whole game, uh, taking corporate money and funneling it into corporate campaigns and then branding it under this umbrella of uh, pro diversity or, you know, helping minority communities. When at the end of the day, um, their main uh, focus is actually helping the, the very wealthy, the special interests that fund them. Unfortunately, we had this narrative after the Silicon Valley bank collapse where people said, oh, they were so focused on having diversity, equity, and inclusion that instead of focusing on this diversity, they forgot to focus on the diversity of their assets and stress test. To me, yeah. I think, you know, maybe there wasn't the confusion that the meeting about the diversity in their assets uh, wasn't conflicting with the, the diversity of, uh, you know, the racial makeup of the board and things like this, which they said was a distraction and why Silicon Valley bank collapsed. I think that's a poor excuse. It's led people to say, oh, diversity activism is the problem. Wanting diversity uh, is the problem, which I wouldn't say that is the problem. The problem is, as you stated, you know, the lobbying for deregulation. And this is a particularly interesting case of corruption. You did some really good reporting on it that Bautista, uh, who wrote this memo, was financially rewarded by the San Francisco based bank. First Republic appointed Bautista to a special advisory board, so ended up getting rewarded for achieving this deregulation. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, to your point, I think, you know, there's a way to split the difference and look at this in a very nuanced way. You know, um, perhaps, you know, you can't blame racial or gender diversity for any of these bank collapse, you know, issues narrowly, of course, but, you know, these banks and other um, corporate interests use the rhetoric around these issues. You know, if you look at their ESG reports, they're saying, hey, look, we're good social actors. We're engaging in, in this or that social responsibility, you know, metric. So we don't need regulation, you know, hey, um, policymakers in DC, um, look at, you know, how valuable we are and how good we are as, as community uh, institutions. Um, we don't need regulation. You know, it, it's, a, it, it's a little bit of a, of a public relations tactic as well. You know, so I, I think we should just be kind of um, holding these powerful banks and other corporations to a high level of scrutiny and, and not really trusting their kind of um, public relations or lobbying tactics. Mm. Lee Fong, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. Thanks for having me.